Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to another day of Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Another day of Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Sorry, I'm just getting started a little bit late or later than, uh, later than usual today. I had some computer issues, so uh, not wanting to be one to be deterred or to quit or to stop in the midst of what I'm doing, I decided I would still persevere. So anyway, praise the Lord. I got the computer back up and running. Good, mor- good morning, Linda. Good to see you. Uh, So today we're going to be dealing with the subject of being filled with the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. It's a term that uh, most Christians are familiar with. Good morning, Darshel. Uh, There's a lot of confusion among God's people about the terms of being filled with the Spirit. And I'm going to say to you that one of the ways to deal with depression, discouragement, anxiety, and so on, and this may be a little bit controversial, right, to say this, uh, some of you are probably going to disagree with me, but I'm going to say, I'm going to, say to you, uh, you're filled with the Spirit at 50. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Good, good morning, Laura. I'm going to say to you that um, I don't think it's possible to, uh, to go through long periods of depression and so on and be filled with the Spirit at the same time. All right, so uh, depending on the type of church you go to or your denomination or the background you have, some people think to be filled with the Spirit means to speak in tongues. Um, I'm going to say no. That doesn't mean that somebody is filled with the Spirit. Some believe that to be filled with the Spirit means that you operate in certain gifts of the Spirit. Um, No, that's not what it means to be filled with the Spirit either. Um, first of all, the Bible talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and not everyone has the gifts of the Spirit or all the same gifts. And if you, whether you believe in the gifts of tongues or not, for example, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, Paul says that not everyone speaks with tongues. And so, but yet, every Christian is commanded to be filled with the Spirit. So whatever being filled with the Spirit is, it, is, it has to be something that every child of God can be because every child of God is commanded to be this way and so over the last few days we've dealt with the first three ways I think that you need to deal with discouragement worry depression and anxiety and the way to do that is one you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind the bent of your thinking must be changed this is not something that happens overnight it is a process it can take weeks it can take months it can take years to be renewed in the spirit of your mind for you to change who and what you are it's not something you're going to do overnight you're not going to start reading the bible today and all of a sudden your thinking is changed and this is why the bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind all right so the mind must be renewed that's the first way to deal with anxiety depression suicidal thoughts worry you must be renewed you must your mindset must be changed and i'm saying it must be changed by the word of god it must be changed by good quality books and materials and teachings and instruction and podcasts and videos and audios and so you need to get the bad things out and put the good things in the bible says in the book of philippians chapter four whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are pure if it be of good report if it be praiseworthy if it be of virtue these are the things that you are to think or to meditate upon and if you get develop the habit of thinking and meditating on the right things those things would begin to change who and what you are. Secondly, we said, to deal with depression, discouragement, anxiety, worry, suicidal thoughts, the way to deal with these things is the second thing you need to do is you need to develop a prayer life. You need to develop the habit of prayer. You can't pray, um, just pray from, you know, every now and then. You've got to pray without ceasing. Prayer needs to become a habit of your life. Prayer needs to be something that you do when things are good and when things go, when things are difficult. All right, so prayer is the second thing we said that you need to do. You need to develop a prayer life. Thirdly, uh, we dealt with yesterday that you need to uh, learn to abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, I will prone, I will, I will cut, I will... Um, you know, he even says at some point that I will, I will cut off that branch if it doesn't bear fruit, showing that his desire is that we have fruitful lives. Now, the way fruit, I didn't get into this yesterday, but fruit, 
There are all types of fruit that we need to bear in our life. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's the fruit of joy. There's fruit of um, there's the fruit, fruitfulness in the sense of, of being uh, prosperous or successful in the things that we are seeking to accomplish. There is fruitfulness in the sense of the ministries and the work that we're doing for and with the Lord, that we are bearing fruit in those areas, that we're being productive, and that we're, the results, we're producing results. So all of that has to do with fruitfulness. Today, what I'm going to deal with is um, the need to be filled with the Spirit. And what I want to say to you, this doesn't always come out in our English translations, but it is there in the original language. When the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, the idea of being filled is, uh, this is a continuous thing. This is not something you do once. You know, you go down the aisle and you have someone lay hands on you, and you are filled with the Spirit. That's not the idea here. To be filled with the Spirit is something that you are continually being. It is something that you are doing on a regular basis, and, um, and we're going to look at what that actually means, and, and uh, I'm going to seek to make the case as to why I think this uh, will help and allows God's people to be able to, um, to deal with discouragement, depression, and, uh, and so on. All right, so what I want to do is I want to begin with prayer, and uh, I'm going to seek to be a half an hour or less. Uh, especially since I started later than usual. But we'll see. We'll see how the Lord directs and leads. And uh, if you can hang around, great. If you can't, I understand. By the way, while I'm speaking, if you ever have questions on anything I'm saying or anything that I've previously said, feel free to post it here because I will seek to answer it. And by the way, your question doesn't have to be directly related to the topic that I'm dealing with. Uh, it, can be a top, it can be about anything uh, because I believe the scriptures answers uh, has answers for any and everything to deal with life all right so the text i 'm going to be looking at uh, at least the place the basis of our study today will be Ephesians chapter five, even though i 'm going to look also at Galatians five, the fruit of the spirit, and uh, i 'm going to look also at uh, Romans okay and so let me begin by matter of fact, I want to begin with Romans. I want to begin with Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 15 before I look at the command to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, this here is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And maybe you, you may know this or maybe you don't know this is in the Bible. But this is a, a great text to meditate on and think about, especially if you're dealing with depression and discouragement. And it's also a good text to pray for others who may be dealing with these, uh, struggling with these issues. So... I want to begin with prayer. Father, as usual, I bow before you this morning, thankful for another day of life, another day of health, another day of your mercies, another day to experience the grace of God, another day to be reminded that, is, that the loving kindness of God is better than life itself, another day to be reminded, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. There is no shadow of turning with you. I bless and praise you this morning, Father. I pray for my brothers and sisters, everyone that will come on these uh, sessions in the mornings, everyone that will see this video at a later point or hear the audio or the sound at some point later. I'm asking, Father, that you would open their eyes and their hearts to the truth of Scripture. I'm praying that you would fill each of us with your Spirit. Give us the desire, Lord, to ask for more of your Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of God, to walk in obedience to you, Lord, and to do that which is right and pleasing in your sight. I pray for every child of God and every person, Lord, that will come in contact with this teaching today that is struggling with depression or discouragement, anxiety, worry, Lord, any of these things that can paralyze us and put us in a state of mind where we are unmotivated, where we feel depleted of resources, where we have no desire to move forward or to take action. I'm asking, Lord, that that spirit will be broken off of the life of every person, Lord, that hears these words this morning. And that each one of these individuals will be filled with your spirit and that you, Lord, will be glorified in these things and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, you know, while I prayed, uh, the Lord has changed my mind on what I am going to start or begin with. And that's one of the reasons why you should pray before you open the scriptures. The text I'm going to begin, begin with is Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Okay. And uh, I'm going to say to you. 
that uh, if you're going to be um, going to deal with eliminate, if you're going to eliminate depression, discouragement, worry from your life, you want to be filled with the Spirit of God. You want to be controlled by the Spirit of the Lord. And, um, and Jesus teaches us, okay, and this is again, you all know the Lord's Prayer, but not enough, not enough of God's people understand what Jesus connects to the Lord's Prayer. And so in Luke chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 1, And it came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. I want you to get this, that there is something about the way Jesus is praying, the fervency of his prayer, the articulation, the communication between him and the Father, the way he is praying, the authority in which he prays, the confidence and courage that is in his heart and soul as he prays, the faith in which he prays, the type of faith he prays with, the, the type of things that these disciples see happens when Jesus prays, it causes one of his followers to say, Lord, he doesn't say, Lord, teach me how to preach. Lord, teach me how to cast out devils. Lord, teach me how to do miracles. Teach me how to raise the dead. He said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And notice the disciple is not selfish in his request. He doesn't say, Lord, teach me how to pray. He is all-encompassing in his prayer request to Christ or his desire to the Lord. He said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And there we get the disciple's prayer. We tend to call it the Lord's Prayer. But it's not really the Lord's prayer, it's the disciples' prayer. It's your prayer, my prayer. This is how we are to pray. And then Jesus says, when you pray, say, Our Father. That's why when I pray, I always, I don't pray to Jesus. I pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Doesn't mean that I can't talk to Jesus or I can't talk to the Holy Spirit at times. I do that because all of them can hear. They are personalities. They can hear and they respond and they answer. But generally, the way my my default position is I begin with praying to the Father in Jesus' name. And then Jesus gives us what we know as the disciples' prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you know that. But I want you to see how he ends this training or teaching. And I say unto you, verse 9, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. The tenses in all of these words is a continuous tense. It means to ask and keep on asking. You don't ask once. To knock and keep on knocking, to seek and keep on seeking. I remember as a young Christian growing up, being part of the Word of Faith movement and the charismatic movement, I was taught that if you are going to pray in faith, that you can't keep asking. If you ask more than once, you are lacking in faith. Well, that teaching, I now understand, to be contrary to what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you must persevere. You get nothing from God without effort. Effort. You get nothing from God without perseverance. You get nothing from God without knocking, asking, and seeking over and over and over again. You will not receive anything from the Lord if you expect it to be easy. You will not eliminate discouragement, worry, anxiety, depression from your life if you expect that God is just going to zap you or just going to cast a demon of depression out of your life. Now, I believe there are some people that their level of anxiety and depression is influenced by demons. It is demonically influenced and they have opened up doors to the devil to their life, maybe through drugs through uh, witchcraft, through alcohol, there's certain things I believe we can do through ha habit over and over again that it gives place to the devil. In the Greek, the idea there is that it opens a door that Satan will have access that he doesn't normally have into the human or mankind's life in general. That's why the Bible says, be angry and sin not, lest you give place to the devil. Anger and wrath I believe are one of those things that opens up the door. If you develop the habit of always being angry, I believe you open the door to Satan in unique ways that he doesn't normally have in your life. And I believe even as a Christian, if you are an angry Christian, that's an, almost like an oxymoron. It's, a, it's Something's wrong there, right? But <clears throat> there are such a thing. There is such a thing. Because we have struggles in our life. But you don't want to be controlled by anger. And this is why you must be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that's why being filled with the Spirit and not being drunk with wine is important to 
you and I being able not only to eliminate these moods and these uh, areas, these challenges in our life, but dealing with sin in general. So Jesus says, we're to ask, we're to seek, we're to knock. And then he says in verse 10, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Do you believe that? Everyone that asks receives. Everyone that knocks, it shall be open. Everyone that seeks will find. If you are asking, knocking, and seeking, and you're not receiving the results, then keep doing it. Because Jesus' Jesus's words are true. Your results are not the truth. Your circumstances are not the truth. The word of God is the truth. The Bible says that which we see is temporary. So that's not true. Facts are not always true. Let me say that again. Facts are not always true. True. Facts can change. Facts are temporary. Facts are in time. Facts are in the moment. What is true is eternal. And this is why it may be, tr it may be a fact that the Red Sea is closed at the moment, but it's not true in the, big, in the mind of God who doesn't live in time because in the matter of moments, he is going to part the Red Sea. So the reality is you and I must learn to live in God's realm in God's economy, in God's kingdom, not in our earthly realm, not in the earth's economy, or not in the earth, earth, um, earth king, earth's kingdom. All right, this is why the Bible says we are to seek first the kingdom of God. You need to learn to live in the kingdom of God, the domain where God reigns. Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God is in your midst. So the kingdom of God is where the presence and the power and the authority of God is. And you can take the kingdom wherever you go. If that authority and that power and the presence of God resides in your life. Now, notice what Jesus says here. He says in verse 11, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he... Will he for a fish give him a serpent. In other words, none of you who have children, if your child asks you for something that is good, okay, let's say that the child asks you, in this case, in that first century, something that was good would be bread. Bread is a staple. Bread is something normal. Bread is something that people need. Give us this day our daily bread. If your child asks you for bread, you're not going to give them a stone. You'd be an evil a terrible father or mother, right? If your child asked you for meat, or for, in this case, Linda doesn't eat meat, so meat wouldn't be a good thing for you. But if your child asked you for vegetables, Linda, you're not going to give your child uh, a serpent or a snake, right? You're not going to you're not going to take the snake, chop up the snake, and make it look like vegetables, and feed that to your child. That would be a bad parent. So you got to get the connection and the contrast that Jesus is saying here. He says, if a son shall ask for bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he asks for an egg, verse 12, will he offer him a scorpion? All right? Now notice Jesus' words. Remember now, this is all part of the answer of the disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray. And the way Jesus ends this is he's going to tell them, Everyone that asks receives, everyone that knocks, it will be open, everyone that seeks will find, and then he's going to tell them what to ask for. And maybe you are depressed, discouraged, filled with anxiety and worry, I'm going to say because you are not filled with, you are not controlled by the Spirit of God. Listen to Jesus' words. If you then being evil, verse 13, know how to give good gifts to, unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Here is the context. Here is what I want you to get. Notice that Jesus is talking to the Father's children. Some of you are in churches and denominations that believe the truth, which is all Christians have the Holy Spirit. But all Christians are not filled with the Spirit. Every child of God has the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to God. You can't be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit residing in your life because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. But guess what? I wish I had a cup near me. I don't have a cup here now. But let's say that, the, that, you're, that you 
that you are a cup. Well, let's see. Here is a cup, this size, okay? Let's use this as an illustration. So this is a cup. Not the best example of a cup, but probably for some of us it is a good, it's a good example because it has holes in it. And sometimes God's people get, get uh, you know, you get, um, uh, uh, I'm going to call it fillings of the Holy Spirit in your life, and it leaks right out because of all the other things in your life that are choking God's life and God's word from the life, right? This happens to all of us. But for the purpose of our illustration, this is the cup. Some of God's people have just that much. See that little lying there, that brim? That's all they have of the Holy Spirit, okay? And how do you know? Because you see the lack of fruit in their life. You see the lack of results in their life. You see the lack of joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, right? That's what I mean, the fruit of the Spirit. So notice Jesus' words. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much will notice your heavenly Father? The Father is not the heavenly Father of the human race. John 8 says to some of the people there, you are of your father, the devil. Some people, some of your family members, their father is the devil. Not everyone, God is their father. Okay? The father is only the father of those who are the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn among many brethren. And so this is a Christian distinction, a Christian doctrine. Other religions of the world may say all of us are God's children. The Bible says all of us are God's offspring. God is the creator of mankind. He's the creator of all. He is not the father of all in the sense that we are adopted into his family. So, but I, what I want you to get is every one of God's children has the Holy Spirit in their life. Romans 8. If you don't have the Spirit, you are not a child of God. But just because you have the Spirit doesn't mean you are filled with the Spirit. The Bible says in Luke 4 and in Matthew 4 that Jesus came out of the wilderness, filled, went up into the wilderness, filled with the Spirit. Jesus was given the Holy Spirit without measure. This is why uh, every word he spoke had life to it. Everywhere he, everywhere he went and everything he touched, everything he did produced life because the life of the Spirit was operating in his life. And so what I want you to get here is Jesus says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? My question is, how often do you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit? Now again, this is tension. It doesn't make sense. How do you ask for something that you have already? Well, this language is, this reality is true throughout whole, all the Bible. The Bible says, we now have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13, it says, These things I have written unto you, that you may know you have eternal life. I know I have eternal life. Yet, Paul says to Timothy, Fight the good fight of faith, that you may lay hold on eternal life. How do you lay hold on something that you have already? Because you have it by faith. That's why. This is a truth that many of God's people miss. We believe that because we have something by faith, we are not to ask for it anymore. We are not to pursue it anymore. We are not to apply effort to fight for it anymore. And I'm going to say to you, part of the reason that many of God's people don't have what God has given and what God has promised is because we don't understand that we have it by faith. And because we have it by faith, faith we are to continue to knock, ask, seek, and possess it. Right? You've heard me say that God doesn't give in the sense of you receiving it. Anything God gives must be taken. So, do you ask God? I'm asking, how many of you, just put, leave comments, how many of you ask God daily to fill you with His Spirit? How many of you ask daily for God to give you the Spirit of the Lord? How many of you ask daily for the guidance of the Spirit, for the leading of the Spirit, for the filling of the Spirit, for the power of the Spirit in your life? Right? You don't want to be controlled by your emotions. You don't want to be controlled by wrath, controlled by anger, controlled by lust, controlled by bitterness, controlled by unforgiveness. You and I can be controlled by all these things. But we are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Ask God daily to fill you with His Spirit. Uh, if you don't do it after today, I mean, if you haven't done it before today, follow Jesus' words. Luke eleven thirteen. 13. 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Don't, things don't have to make sense, by the way. If you're going to be a Christian and you expect everything to make sense, doctrinally, and if you're one of those Christians who believe you can fit everything into your little systematic theology and have it all hammered out where everything will be perfect, you will always miss the miracle working power of God. Always. I love systematic theology. But systematic theology is not the truth in the sense that Christ is truth. And often the Bible, if you read it properly, it's going to be filled with tension. And some things are not going to fit nicely together. And it's not always going to make sense. And this is why the Bible says, unless we become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. Or we cannot see the kingdom of God. There are some things within the kingdom of God, in the working of God's kingdom, that we will not see unless we become like little children. Why? Because little children are very humble. Little children are teachable. Little children don't have to have it all together. Sometimes we need to have it all together in that uh, that hinders us. All right, so any questions on that? Anybody has a question on that before I, I move on? Any questions on that uh, before I move on? God says, God commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. We're to ask for the Spirit. Ask God to fill you. Ask Him to drive the enemy out of your life. Okay? Um, I pray that often. I take authority over the powers of darkness in my life. All right? I take authority over the powers of darkness in my life. And what that looks like is this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command every spirit of depression, discouragement, heaviness, all right, uh, evil thoughts, lustful thoughts. I take authority over the power of the enemy in Jesus' name. And I'm asking you, Lord, even right now, to fill me with your spirit. I'm asking you to give me. And, I, you know, to do this, I feel like I have to do it with a sense of authority. You notice how, the, how, you notice how my voice raised? There's something about feeling like when you are dealing with the spirit ram, you need to get louder, right? The Bible says, shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. When they shouted in the Old Testament, the idea is they made noise, they shouted, in the victory. They didn't wait until they had the victory. They shouted by faith because they believed what God had commanded them to do. And so, be filled with the Spirit. So, let's go now to Ephesians 5. And this is probably going to be a two-part because I want to look at Galatians 5 where we deal with the gifts of the Spirit and all that. But again, let's begin with this basic, basic, basic doctrinal truth. Every child of God has the Holy Spirit. Just because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're not carnal. Just because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're not a carnal person. What do I mean by carnal? When the Bible talked about carnality in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says that they all said, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Jesus, I'm of Calvin, I'm of Arminius. If you are divided from God's people, okay, if you are divided from the people of God because of your denomination, because of your doctrinal convictions. And I'm not talking about the essentials. I'm talking about the essentials are we are all to believe the gospel. Jesus died and rose again. Jesus ascended to heaven. Right? We know what the gospel is. But if you are divided from the Baptist because you're a Pentecostal, if you are divided from the Presbyterian because you're an Anglican, if you are separated from the Lutheran because you are a word of faith or a charismatic, you are carnal. I don't care how many gifts you have. I don't care how anointed you believe you are. Carnality is not seen just by wicked works, lustful thoughts. It begins by the basic minimum. So it begins, it begins with the basic minimum. All right? And if you don't believe me, some of you probably don't, so let me read it. Because there's a lot of carnality online among God's people. Fighting online, you know, Republicans against Democrats, that's carnal. If you're a Christian, uh, you should, the, 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 this is what maturity looks like. And this is why we must be filled and controlled by the Spirit. That's what the Bible means when it says be filled with the Spirit. That means to, when it says be not drunk with wine, the idea is, to be controlled with wine, to be controlled with alcohol. A person who is drunk is no longer in control of themselves. They, they are controlled by something else. 
This is why God warns us to not get drunk. Why? Because we are to be sober and to be vigilant. I've said in previous talks that if you are not controlled, if your mind is not controlled, if you are not sober-minded, again, that opens doors for Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so uh, I am going to have to continue this, Lord willing, tomorrow, only because of sake of time. But listen to, listen to the words of the scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Okay? There are people who have the Holy Spirit in their life, but they're still carnal in their attitude, carnal in their behavior, carnal in their disposition, carnal in their temperament, carnal in their personality. I'm not saying that I have arrived. I haven't. But I ask God to fill me on a regular basis. I ask Him to change me regularly. Uh, some of you know that's, that, that song. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. Set me free. That's something you should pray on a regular basis. Search me, O oh God. The psalmist said that. So when I'm talking about what I'm stating, <coughs> what I'm stating now, I'm not saying that we don't have continual things that we need to kill in our life and put to death and to mortify. But what I am saying is. Notice what the Bible describes, carnality, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 3. For ye are yet carnal, how come? For whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? See, the more we are controlled by the Spirit, the less division we have among us and God's people. The less strife we have. They were called carnal because among them, in their midst, in that assembly of God's people, there was envying, there was strife, there was division. And then he just, and just in case, you know, they're, they're not sure what he means. Verse 4, for while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of, of Apollos, are you not carnal? You see what carnality is? Carnality is division. Carnality is strife. The Spirit of the Lord brings unity. It doesn't mean that we are to be united with people. Two cannot walk together except they agree. We're not talking about, um, about the ecumenical movement. Can't we all just get along? No. But just because you don't get along with someone doesn't mean you need to be arguing with them. Doesn't mean there needs to be strife in your heart. Doesn't mean there needs to be tension and arguments between you and them. All right? And so in order to deal with that, I'm going to say to you, you need to ask God to fill you with His Spirit. You need to ask God to fill you with the Spirit. Why? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. That's the first part of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. If you have long-suffering in your life, you will suffer long even with those you disagree with. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Wow. Yes, you'll be gentle to all men when you're filled with the Spirit. Gentleness. Goodness. Meekness. Yes, meekness. The servant of the Lord must not strive. Strive is carnality, but you must be meek. Many of God's people, especially in Baptist circles, Baptist circles, Reformed circles, Calvinistic circles, Presbyterian circles, because we fight against the Pentecostal movement, we lack the Spirit of the Lord in our life. And I say we. I'm going to identify myself with you for the moment. There are times I'm going to identify myself with the past Pentecostal movement, movement when I want to make a point to that group. Because I have truths, I believe, from both circles. 
There are many in that conservative group of the church that lacks the Spirit of God, okay with strife, okay with division, in the name of pursuing truth and sound doctrine, and you don't understand you are carnal. You believe you are being righteous because you are pursuing truth. But notice that the Bible says the law came through Moses. I'm going to make the point that it's not truth that you are pursuing. It is law you're pursuing. See, law creates division. Law creates walls. Isn't it ironic that the Bible says in John 1, it doesn't say that truth came through Moses? But the law is the truth. But it doesn't say that about Jesus. It says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You need both together. To just pursue and just have truth, it's not enough. It makes you hard. And just to have grace, it makes you too soft. You need to marry both. You need to have grace and truth. There are times you need to cleanse the temple of the money changes. You can't keep going into the temple and compromising with the money, money changes. Compromising meaning you know that's there and you never speak up about it. That's grace without truth. You need to have both. All right? So carnality. And so uh, let me end here with Ephesians 5. I'm just going to, for the sake of time, when you're going to deal back to our study, if you're going to deal with depression, discouragement, okay, just like you would deal with lust, anger, wrath. All of these things, by the way, are sinful attitudes. Now, I know our society has made depression, discouragement, worry, and anxiety have, have made them sort of mental conditions, made them, um, uh, you know, um, they've made them acceptable. But I'm going to tell you the Bible makes them sin. I know this doesn't sound right, and it's not going to fit with some people's doctrine and theology. Worry in the scriptures is a sin. You don't believe me? Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6. Worry is a sin. Anxio anxiety, anxious thoughts, meaning where, the, the, where you allow your concern about things, about something, about someone, about family members, about things happening, if you allow that to paralyze you, now that's become sin. Does it mean that we don't have seasons where things are tough and difficult? But listen to Jesus' words. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I say unto you. Whenever you see a therefore, always ask, why is it there? What is it there for? Before that, he says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Notice how Jesus connects taking thought for your life. That's the Bible's way of saying being anxious about your life. I can't pay my mortgage. Take no thought for your life, Jesus says. Uh, I'm worried about such and such. He says you can't serve two masters. And then he goes from that to the therefore. The therefore is con connected to who and what we serve. Worry makes you serve the thing or the things that you are worried about. Those things become more, cons more bigger to us than God. This is why the majority of the children of Israel, over 40, were, died in the wilderness. Why? They were worried. They were anxious. They were concerned that what God had promised, he would not fulfill. And they were angry and bitter towards God because they felt that God did not take care of them in the wilderness. I would say that many of them were depressed, many of them were discouraged, many of them were filled with anxiety, and that's why they murmured and complained. You don't murmur and complain when you're filled with joy. You don't murmur and complain when you're filled with peace. You don't murmur and complain when you're filled with hope. You murmur and complain when you lack those things. This is why we must be filled with the Spirit. You can't do this on your own. You need the Spirit of the Lord. Why? Yesterday, without me, you can do nothing. Jesus says, verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or, or for your body, what you shall wear. Now here's the interesting thing. Most of us don't have to worry about what we eat, what we drink, or what we wear. If you live in America, that's probably the least of your thoughts. Your anxious thoughts are much bigger than those basics. You're, right, you're, more anxious, you're concerned about your children. You're worried about your spouse. You're worried about your job. You're worried about retirement. You're worried about your future. You're worried about uh, maybe a loss of income. You're worried about sickness in your body. 
The things you are worried and anxious about are bigger than being concerned about what am I going to wear today. All right? I can wear this same shirt every day. I'll be fine. In the first century, they didn't have that same access. And yet Jesus says, even those basic bare minimums, you're not to worry about. This is an impossible demand on us from the Lord. To be a Christian is hard. If you will hear, you know, there are people are like, being a Christian is easy. You better turn them off. That's not true. You know, all the positive thinkers that only say positive things and never tell you how hard it is and how you have to suffer and things that struggle and trials and tribulation. Being a Christian is very hard because you have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay? Jesus says here, just doing this alone is very hard to do. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat. He's not saying don't provide and don't plan for the future. He's not saying don't be a person that don't care. Don't be a person. He's not saying be a person that doesn't care about anything. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about being paralyzed by anxiety, being paralyzed by worry, being paralyzed by discouragement and depression, where they stop you from doing, obeying God and doing what you need to do. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Right? Then he says, uh, let me skip down. Verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, or the world. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. You see that? They have to be added to our lives. They're not normal. They're added. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the, for, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. And notice how Jesus ends this verse. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you only watch Joel Osteen, your thinking will be warped. Joel Osteen is a great motivational speaker. He is awesome if you want to be pumped up and be inspired. But Joel Osteen is terrible if you uh, want to have a biblical mindset when it comes to dealing with trouble in life. Why? Because Jesus here says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus understands that every day has evil. Or that some points in your life are going to have evil. This is why we're told to put on the armor of God that we may be able to stand when? In the evil day. The Bible assumes that there comes a day that's going to be overwhelming, that's going to be difficult, that's going to make you want to lay in bed and go under the covers and not come out because life can be challenging. But you got to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord. you got to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord. So, again... There are some guys, there are some good people out there that are good motivational speakers and they're positive and they, you know, um, nothing is ever wrong, right? They don't talk about negative things. They just stay positive. Um, and sometimes you need that. But if that's the only diet you're on, you're not arming yourself. You're not putting on the complete armor of God. And you need to put on the complete armor so that when the trials, difficulty, the challenges come, you're able to stand. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. All right? So let me end here. I'll just read this text. And Lord willing, tomorrow we'll continue with the need. If you're going to deal with anxiety, depression, discouragement, to do these things, you need to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Just because you're a child of God doesn't mean you have enough of the Holy Spirit in your life. Ephesians 5.18, 5.17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Are you one of those Christians who, you're, you know, a lot of times God's people are trying to figure out God's will. Well, the first basic will of God for you as a child of God is that you would be filled with the Spirit. He says, don't be unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is ex excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, the Greek or the idea there is be being filled with the Holy Spirit. All right?
This is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's something that you and I should desire in our lives. And so I am going to end here, and Lord willing, we'll continue tomorrow. Please invite some friends, tag friends, share this. You know, I'd love to see us get up to hundreds and hundreds of people that come on every morning uh, for daily nuggets of wisdom, that desire to be encouraged and, and, and strengthened and, and, and exhorted by the Word of God uh, and prayer so that you can start your day well, all right? My goal eventually is to get to half an hour, 15 minutes to half an hour, but we'll see. You know, you see, I, I can get on into, into a subject and I go all over the place. But I hope you found something helpful. As usual, please let me know. You know, leave a note here if this was encouraging to you. And don't forget to tag, share, and invite others. And, um, and uh, yeah, let me know if you are being notified uh, when I go live. All right? Again, four tools so far that we've dealt with on how to deal with anxiety, depression, discouragement, worry, anxious thoughts, uh, suicidal thoughts. Even God's people feel like dying. Take my life. Okay? Just because you have those thoughts, though, doesn't mean you need to carry out your thoughts. Just because you have thoughts of, uh, feel like, I want to kill this person, right, doesn't mean you need to carry out what you feel. You can't be controlled by your feelings. You must be controlled by God, by the Spirit of God and by His Word. And so the four things that we dealt with, number one, you must be renewed in your mind, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Secondly, you must develop, develop the habit of prayer or a prayer life. Pray without ceasing. Thirdly, you got to abide in Christ. The idea of to abide is to continue, to remain, stay connected to the vine. Jesus is the vine and you and I are the branches, but we can choose not to be connected to the vine. Okay? We must stay connected. We must remain connected to the vine. And, th and fourthly, you must be filled with the Spirit of God. Ask God for His Spirit in your life. Lord willing, we'll continue this tomorrow. Thank you all for hanging out. Continue to spread the word. And uh, again, welcome to Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. God bless. Bye.